Okay, so I think we are live on YouTube now. So, uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 15th International Primatology Lecture on Past, Present, and Future Perspectives of the Field, brought to you by the Center for International Collaboration and Advanced Studies in Primatology, or SICASP, at Kyoto University. Uh, this lecture series highlights scientific careers of distinguished primatologists from across the world, which we hope will um, uh, promote reflections on the historical development of the field of primatology and where it should be headed next. Um, you can watch previous lectures in this uh, lecture series if you go to the SciCast YouTube channel. And uh, after today's lecture, there will be time for Q&A. So please stick around until the end if you can. Um, now I'd like to ask Dr. Mike Huffman, who is the founder of this lecture series, to introduce today's speaker, Professor Tom Strusaker. Thanks, Susumu. And thank you, Tom, for taking the time to, to do this for us. Um, we've all been waiting anxiously to, to have you join us today. I just want to um, say a few brief things to the audience. Um, I don't know if Tom remembers this, but when I first got started in primatology as a high school student, um, I, I had the opportunity in the, the last year of high school, that summer break, to go to St. Kitts and spend two weeks studying vervet monkeys with Michael McGuire from UCLA. And I pulled out that copy of his monograph, of, um, of Michael McGuire's monograph, and I went back to the references because I remember I, I was still in high school and I didn't have access to a lot of journals and things, but um, I was looking at the reference and I was really interested in the ecology and I have all of Tom's papers, the only papers in, in the, the reference list, all of Tom's on the vervet monkey checked off things that I have to get a hold of. And I think I actually wrote to you, Tom, and asked if you could send me um, reprints. I'm sure you get thousands of those um, kinds of Request, but it really stuck out in, in my memory getting started to have someone who actually responded and sent me papers. And I, I, I always remember that. And I really appreciate oh. you reaching out like that, Tom. And I'm, I'm always telling students when you're interested in, in, in a topic and you read someone's papers and you, you, you want to know more about their work or you just want a paper that you can't access some other way, write, write to the author. There's a lot of good people out there like Tom who are willing to share their knowledge. Um, and as many years back as it's been, I still remember that. And I really ap appreciate you doing that for me, Tom. Um, oh, yeah. Much of, of what, what Tom's career has, has been based on Red Colobus, but he's looked at a lot of different, very interesting topics. And and the, the vervet monkey was something that he did very early on. And he, he wrote like five papers in, in, in one year on that that study that he he did when he was starting out in his career, and we'll hear more about all of his career and and, and the beginning years as as well. So pay attention to that and 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 see how Tom has progressed through his his career and all the different things that he's been interested in. Primates don't live; they aren't isolated from everything else around them. So it's if if you have an interest in the ecology, the behavior, and and everything the, the people that all comes back together and makes makes your experience in the field much richer and and i'm looking forward to, to to getting some more of tom's rich experiences in today's talk so i'll hand it over to you now tom thank you very much thanks very much mike let me get in to share the screen here um here we go Start here i'm a bit all right and i will and the slideshow. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Mike, for a fine introduction and for the invitation to, to speak to you today. Much of what I'm going to say today is, is elaborated on a greater extent in two recent publications that I would recommend you read if you're interested in getting more detail on what I have on my lecture. The first that you want to look at if you're interested in the scientific aspects of my, my career, it, I published recently this year in the journal Primates uh, upon the invitation of uh, John Mutani, an old friend and colleague, uh, in which I 
discuss the development and, and progress of, of my research career and life in studying primates. And in December of last year, I published a memoir called I Remember Africa. This is um, very different. There is some science in it, but for the most part, it talks about the kinds of things I experienced over more than half a century of living and working in Africa. And some of the stories are funny and some of them are not funny at all, but uh, it, it's um, a different approach. It's more about um, the conditions of, of living there and how things have changed so dramatically over half a century. Um, it's probably a little more fun reading than some of the scientific stuff. <clears throat> so what I want to do today is to discuss how my career developed and progressed, just as, as Mike said. And I'll summarize a few research findings, but I'm not going to get heavy into the data. Um, when I finish up talking about the research progression, um, I'll, I'll make a few suggestions, to, especially to the younger primatologists as they start out. And in fact, Mike has hit on some of them just before in the introduction. And following that, I will then talk about some of the conservation issues and lessons that I have learned as it deals primarily with African primates. Well, the first point I'd like to make is that mentors can be critical in the development of your career and its progression. I was very lucky in life. I had many, many excellent mentors who really helped me along. The first was my brother. Uh, Paul was three years older than me, and he, um, he majored in, in geology and zoology and went on to become a marine fisheries biologist uh, working for the U.S. government in the Western Atlantic, uh, Caribbean, the Gulf of Mexico, and especially the Hawaiian archipelago. When Paul was a, uh, an undergraduate student, he was, as I say, a few years ahead of me, he would come home and we would discuss everything he learned in his classes. And we were constantly pulling out maps, um, looking at places we'd like to visit and explore. We were both interested in travel and exploration. I had a very supportive family as well. Um, my father uh, here, shown on, here's when I'm six years old, and the, and the family farm down in Ohio. Uh, my dad was, um, worked for the uh, Conservation Commission in the state of Michigan, and he was this, became the secretary of that commission. In that position, he did everything he could to raise funds for the creation of state parks, recreation areas, conservation areas in essence and the gem of which is the known as the uh, Porcupine Mountain State Park. That's known to a lot of people in the US and probably not to many people overseas, but it's a, just a fabulously beautiful area in the Northern uh, Peninsula of, of, um, of Michigan. Here's my younger brother, Paul, and my little sister, Annie, and my mom. Now, uh, my mother was extremely supportive of our education. My father passed away at the young age of 49 and mom made sure we all finished university. And we all went on to get higher degrees as well. So great credit to her. When I was an undergraduate at Michigan State University, I worked part-time every year between classes at the uh, University Museum. The director at that time was Roland Baker. Roland was just a fantastic mentor. His specialty was in small mammals, mainly rodents and, and bats and so forth, but everything, mainly in the deserts of the southwestern U.S. and northern Mexico. When I went on to graduate school, Peter Marler became my mentor and professor. A very supportive, became a great friend, and we collaborated for many years after that university experience. Uh, so at Michigan State, it was in the days when they still taught organismal biology. I majored in something called the biological sciences, which meant I could take courses in nearly any subject that had anything whatever to do with biology. That's in the days when they still taught ornithology, botany, entomology, mammalogy, all of these things. And I must say, I fell in love with all these subjects. I thought I could get involved in any of them. I got particularly interested in the physiological basis of behavior. I thought that's what I would study for my PhD. I knew right away by my second or third year in university, I had to get a PhD if I wanted to be able to do, have some degree of independence in what I did as, as, for employment. I mentioned I worked at the museum, which was a great source of um, uh, enlightenment. Uh, there were graduate students who worked there on their own research projects and they took me under their wing and I thought I was going to study ornithology for a long time. And then it was gonna be entomology. <laughs> so I had some trouble making up my mind. 
And my summers I spent working as a park ranger um, between school sessions and my final summer as a um, undergraduate, I had a great experience to work on a trout project in the beautiful streams of Northern Michigan. We were tagging and releasing trout. It was a marvelous experience. Um, when I graduated, before I went on to graduate school, Roland Baker, the director of the museum, invited me to join his annual expedition to Northern Mexico for a collecting. So we spent uh, the better part of the summer collecting in the Sonoran and Chihuahuan Desert. This was my first time to, to leave the United States and it was a great experience. I was the youngest guy on the, on the expedition. There were a couple of other profs and some graduate students. And I think the most outstanding thing about this experience was that I realized I could make a living working in nature, working outdoors, studying nature, the very thing I loved, the sort of thing I would do on a vacation. So I went on to grad school from there um, in, in the Department of Zoology at the University of California. At that time, there was a, I guess you could call it a renewed interest in the US of A in primate field studies. Of course, all the research in Japan probably continued right on through, although World War II disturbed a lot of that. But at that time, Urban DeVore had just come back from his study of, of baboons in Nairobi National Park. And his supervisor was Sherwood Washburn. They had some interesting ideas about social organization. And at the same time, Phyllis Lee came back from her study of Hanuman Lang Langers in India. They were all suggesting that gross habitat could predict social organization. And that was based to a large extent on the herbs study of the baboons. So they're out in the open savanna. There are lots of predators, lions and leopard in particular. So the idea is that selection would favor large groups with lots of big males as a defense against these predators. Now to test this hypothesis, it occurred to me that we really should start studying other primate species that lived in the savanna, and that immediately brought to mind the patus monkeys. Now, as you all know, patus monkeys, of course, live in the open savanna. They're very fast, they're supposedly the, the fastest primate in the world. It wasn't really much known about them. There were some natural history notes that suggested they did not fit this hypothesis. And in fact, they lived in smaller groups than baboons and had only one adult male. So I thought, I'll go out and study patus monkeys. Peter Mahler, whose specialty was at that time and remains so until um, his career was over, was bird song development. But somehow he became interested in this renewed interest in field, primate field studies. So he took me under his wing and that was just a fantastic opportunity for me because he was a, a, just a great mentor. So in 1962, I set off at the end of 62 to begin my study of, attempted study of patus monkeys. It's hard to believe I was 24 years old and this was the first time I'd ever been on an airplane. That will sound strange to younger generations who start flying probably before they can walk even. Um, Uganda had just received, uh, um, uh, achieved independence a few months before my arrival. And so it was an interesting transitional period. So I was sent out to study patus and vervet monkeys. The challenge was to find a suitable study site. I spent nearly six months traveling all over Uganda, even got over into Lake Turkana in Kenya, even when we went to the Congo, not so much for patus monkeys, but just to experience a different part of the world. I ended up not studying patus monkeys for the obvious reason that in Uganda, most patus monkeys are found in areas with extremely tall grass. Now here's a terrestrial species. These were not like the baboons in, in Nairobi National Park. These animals lived in tall grass, much taller than I am, and they're on the ground. I would occasionally get views of them peeking a, around a termite mound or something like that. Although I gave up studying palace monkeys, I realized that they did not fit the hypothesis of DeVore and Washburn. They did indeed, as early natural history notes indicated, live in relatively smaller groups with only one adult male. That much I could um, ascertain. Um, Ronnie Hall came along later, soon after my attempt at it, and he was a little more successful. 
but he still ran into these same difficulties I mentioned due to poor visibility. After surveying a bit in Kenya, I was directed primarily, I think it was Herb Devore, to the Amboseli Vervitz, where I spent a year. And that was the best advice I'd been given in a long, long time. I'll remind you that at this time, we did not have the technology that we have today. There were no cell phones, no internet or email. We only communicated with the old blue aerograms. And sometimes it would take one to two months to get a reply from the States. And there were no computers, just manual typewriters. And you did a lot of your calculations by hand. So as I said, I arrived in Uganda and set off, went up here first to Queen Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth Park to look for Pattis. They were there, but just almost impossible to see. I went up to Kidevo before it became a national park right on the Sudan border. Again, very scarce, very rare up there, very difficult to see. So it, it became apparent I really had to switch species and vervets seemed the obvious one because they were abundant everywhere. I surveyed in Kenya, as I mentioned, and end up again being directed to Amboseli National Park. It was a game reserve at that time, not a national park. It was uh, just a marvelous situation and it still is, but uh, things have changed like everywhere. There are far fewer trees now than when I was there. It um, sits in view of Mount Kilimanjaro, marvelous place. Here's my old Land Rover. I lived in this for the better part of six months and it was good to get a permanent camp set up. Uh, here's what the young Strusaker looked like back in 1964. <laughs> yeah, the beard has changed color for some reason. <laughs> um, and the vervets, the thing about Amboseli, the vervets were all over the place. And because of tourism and everything, they were pretty well habituated. We did, there weren't a, a huge number of tourists, but just enough to get these animals tame. So it, uh, within a week or so, I had several groups habituated for observation. I lived in this tent. We had no running water or electricity, of course. Used kerosene lamps and collected water from a nearby tank that was fed by a well. And that tank was shared by all the rangers and everyone who worked in the, in the uh, game reserve. Those were different times. Um, not long after I'd been there, maybe a month or two, I was up in Nairobi and I met up with Herb DeVore and he introduced me to two of the finest people I've, I've had met in my career. That was Stuart and Gene Altman. At that time, they were looking for a place to study baboons and they'd been surveying around Northern Tanzania and um, uh, started in Kenya. And I think Irv also had suggested that they come to Amboseli, but I certainly, when I met them, I realized these are some fine people and I did everything I could to encourage them to join me in Amboseli. Fortunately, they did. We got together every evening for dinner we discussed our observations, our methodology, and various ideas and hypotheses. It was just a fantastic experience. Stewart had studied, of course, monkeys on Cayo Santiago, the rhesus there, and the howler monkeys on Barro Colorado Island in Panama. Jean had never studied primates before, but she had a strong background in mathematics, and it was a very critical thinker, a, gr a great intellect. <clears throat> Well, as, as uh, Mike mentioned, I, I, I did this study on vervets because virtually nothing, nothing was known about them at the time. I was able to study just about anything you could observe in, in, in nature, and that was the behavior in ecology. I think the study is probably best known for my description of the three classes of predator alarm calls. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> One for uh, mammalian predators and another for avian predators, and then another for uh, poisonous snakes or snakes that could potentially prey upon them, such as the rock python. Excuse me a minute. <clears throat> but there was a lot more to the study than just these alarm calls. And I found it just, just a fascinating experience. It was a great time in life, developing your own research project and your own ideas with the help of others, of course. Well, when I finished this field work, I was to go back and write up my thesis. But about that time, Peter Marler, my professor, was taking a leave of absence, a sabbatical to study black and white colobus in Uganda. So the, the Altmans kindly offered a position for me up at the University of Edmonton in Alberta, where Stewart held a position. And again, this was great for me because as you're writing up data, you always want to be 
able to have someone around who knows something about your study to knock ideas around with and to discuss analyses and so forth. So it was just fabulous having them uh, as, as my hosts. And they were just fine friends and, and mentors. Following the grad school, I did a short study on, on elk in uh, the um, Rocky Mountain National Park of, in Banff, of, 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 uh, not Rocky Mountain National Park, but Banff National Park in Canada. And that was a marvelous experience as well. Um, different sort of things I had to watch out for there, mainly grizzly bears. Um, so back in Berkeley, uh, worked along with Peter and about that time, he was given an appointment with the Rockefeller University and the New York Zoological Society, who <clears throat> along with Don Griffin of bat echolocation fame, they formed the Institute for Research of Animal Behavior. It was a collaborative effort between the Rockefeller and New York Zoological Society. And I was one of those lucky ones who was asked to join them. At this time, it was clear that we were going to further pursue these uh, uh, hypotheses of gross behavior and, and social organization. We really needed to get some studies done on rainforest primates because that's where the majority of primates live. So with that in mind, I thought, maybe I should try to study drills in Cameroon. Cameroon is a, an incredible place. So I went out there and worked there for about 19 months <clears throat> trying to study drills because at that time, drills were thought to be closely related to baboons. So you've got drills living in the rainforest, baboons living in the savanna. How do the social organization compare? Well, as I mentioned, Cameroon is a, an incredible place for biodiversity and endemism. But everything, virtually everything is hunted and eaten. And I mean everything. I can't think of anything that, that isn't eaten there. And drills, of course, were one of the prey items eaten by the people. So it, it meant that it was really going to be difficult to get the kind of detailed data that I had hoped for, something that I could take, compare directly with studies of baboons and my studies of vervets and so forth. So I became opportunistic. Um, and this is what you have to do sometimes, just be flexible and be opportunistic. So basically, I, I expanded my study to anything any primate I see does. So we collect a lot of information on social organization, you know, the basic ecology and where they're found and so on and so forth. <clears throat> As I said, Cameroon is, is an interesting place, but difficult, not only because animals are hunted there, but because of the rainfall. The study, study site I selected was on the coast of Cameroon in the windward side of Mount Cameroon. So that year we got 11 meters of rain. That is a heck of a lot of rain. Uh, I was wet most of the time. One thing, the one consequence of this heavy rainfall at Edenau was that I would take time off to survey other parts of Cameroon that did not get as much rainfall and even spend a month in what was then known as Rio Muni, now Equatorial Guinea, and Ghana. Uh, perhaps one of the biggest thing I learned in this 19 months of Cameroon is just how threatened the forest was and the animals by logging, agriculture, and hunting. In 1972, I published a paper in Primates, which was my first attempt to suggest that we have more rainforest parks. <clears throat> Here's a general map of Cameroon. There's more information here than you need, but Mount Cameroon is here and my study area was here. And so the, the winds come in across the Atlantic. The anticyclone of St. Helena comes in and dumps a huge amount of water on Fernando Po, which is now Bioko, and then it hits Edenau, <clears throat> very, very wet. So um, with a, a trusty, well, initially by myself, but um, I would explore all kinds of areas all along here, Campo Reserve and over into John. We even went up to the northern end of Cameroon to look at Pallas monkeys in the Waza National Park. <clears throat> Most of the areas were roadless. And so when we had to pack in, we'd employ uh, porters to help carry the food and camping gear and everything else in. This is one of our trips. Among other things, this, one gets to learn a lot about some of these small villages deep in the hinterland of the rainforest of Cameroon. Many of these places you'd go in and, and people younger than 15 years of old had never seen a white man. So uh, I had to put up with a lot of staring and crowds of people hanging around, <laughs> a weird experience. Ferdinand Namata, I met him not long after I settled at Edenau. 
he was said to be the best hunter in the area. I employed him on the condition that he stopped hunting and he just worked with me to find animals, to keep me from getting lost and so forth. He was what I call a, a bush intellectual. He was a real naturalist in every sense of the world, word. He knew not only about the animals that he wanted to eat, but he knew about other things that he had no intention whatever of catching, everything from insects to birds and so on and so forth. So he was just a great, a great person to have, a great companion. He was always cheerful, very hardworking, and um, just knew a lot about the forest. I could not have achieved anywhere near what I did without his assistance. And so we traveled all over uh, Cameroon for the better part of a year. I, um, again, you don't really have time to go to the detailed results from Cameroon, but we learned a lot about group size and composition of primate social groups there. And that, um, what we found just really did not correlate with the general hypothesis that habitat uh, organization, sorry, that social organization could be correlated with gross habitat. We found large groups with lots of males in them and uh, both on the ground and in the trees, and single male groups and so forth. I think that's one of the things that really struck out, uh, struck, struck me as, as being very profound was the abundance of polyspecific associations. They were very common. Everywhere we went, we had these mixed species flocks, if you want to call them that. At one time, we had five species of Gwenins together in one association. We also, I also discovered Gwenin hybrids in the forest for the first time. I do believe this was the first observation. We knew they hybridized in captivity, but this was the first observation to find them in the rainforest at a couple of different sites. I made a lot of tape recordings because of course, this is something I picked up from Peter Marler, became very interested in vocalizations, but it became apparent too that they're very stable characters at least in African monkeys, and good indicators of phylogenetic affinity. As I mentioned, one of the biggest lessons was just how much trouble all this beautiful wildlife was in, from hunting and uh, logging and agriculture. <clears throat> Back in New York, I wrote up my results from Cameroon, and I was again in the same institution with Peter, and he began telling me about some of his experiences during his sabbatical year in Uganda. And he said he took a, a, a day out from his studies of colobus, black and white colobus in the Wudongo forest to, to go down to visit the Kibali forest in Western Uganda. And there he saw red colobus for the first time. And he, he was immediately struck by the fact that their social organization was very different from black and white colobus. You know, the black and whites living in small groups with one male, red colobus living in big groups, apparently with several males. So it, it seemed that red colobus was really um, a species uh, worthy of detailed study. So um, in 1969, I set out in Senegal and Gambia to conduct a survey, trying to find a good place to study red columbus. Went all the way over there, took six months, finally got into Uganda and discovered paradise in Kiwali, where I ended up living as a long-term resident for 18 years. <clears throat> So in addition to seeing and studying the red colobus in Kibali and those that I saw in, in those surveys in the 1970, I have also studied red colobus in the Tana River of Kenya, in the Zanzibar and the Dzungwa of Tanzania, Bioko of Equatorial Guinea and the Turi Forest of DRC. So I do have some experience with red colobus. Just gives you an idea of the 18 different taxa of red colobus all the way from Senegal and Gambia over here in the west. So I saw them there and here in Ivory Coast and on the island of Bioko in the Korob National Park, over here in the Turi, and uh, I guess this is supposed to be Kibali here, and uh, down here in western Tanzania, and then the Dzungo population, those on the Tana River and those on uh, Zanzibar. This gives you an idea of the variation in the color and general external appearance of them. This one is from the Ujungwas, from Zanzibar, from Bioko, from Gambia, and from Kibali. Quite a diversity there. I settled on Kibali, and my main study site was at a forest research station, a forestry station here at Kanyawada. After several years of working there, I established a second camp called Ngogo 
and many of you will know of Ngogo because of the long-term research studies done on chimpanzees there by John Mitani and David Watts in particular, and by many, many of their students. Uh, lots and lots of people are now working in Kibali and hundreds and hundreds of papers have resulted from this initial effort. Why Kibali? Well, there were lots of red colobus, at least 10 other primate species, and the, the monkeys were, were not hunted. The primates weren't hunted, at least not with guns. Now, some of them inadvertently got caught in snares, but people were not after them. It was a great climate as well. At 1,500 meters elevation near the equator, rainfall was only moderate, diversity of habitats, and the people were very friendly. This is not the whole story. And I have to tell you that the context in which we did this work changed very soon after I arrived and settled in there. Well, first of all, let me show you some of the monkeys from Kibali. Red colobus, black and whites, gray cheek mangabees, red tail monkeys, and blues, beautiful place. As I said, it's important to know about the conditions under which we worked. I meant to say it's a beautiful forest too. I built this simpleton shack just because I, I thought maybe I'll spend a year here, maybe two. Built the place in 10 days. It had a cement concrete platform and that was it. But years later, I was still there and uh, I got married and suddenly there were flowers. Kibale Forest Project objectives were, as I mentioned, to uh, study red colobus behavioral ecology. Well, that, that soon expanded to try and do interspecific comparisons. And we ended up working on seven, five out of the seven monkey species plus chimpanzees. That's now expanded so that baboons are being studied as well. So it's six out of seven. We also became concerned about the impact of selective logging on wildlife. I uh, mentioned that it was a forest reserve when I began there, many, meaning it was to be a production forest. It was meant to produce timber. So we wanted to know about the impact of this logging on the wildlife and forest regeneration. I was very much concerned that we needed to train people, not only foreign nationals, but Ugandans as well. So training of, of um, um, PhD and master's students became a critical part of the project and education of the school teachers and, and the high school students in the surrounding area. And of course, we developed the field station, which has continued to grow. In 1970, I began lobbying for park status. It took 23 years to get the park established, but uh, you'll soon see why it took so long. The, the country became just a, a place of chaos. And I also tried to assist with law enforcement, many anti-poaching activities. The political history a bit, um, it was initially a British protectorate, which is di very different from a colony. The, the foreigners could not own land there. They could get long-term leases, but they did not own land. Um, as I said, they gained independence in 62, so shortly before my first arrival, my first time there. Soon after I arrived in 1970, Idi Amin, who was a general in Milton Obote's government, overthrew Obote, took over. Uh, we didn't know what to think of that. A year later, I mean, deported all of people who were of Indian and Pakistani descent. And this led to a decline in all services because the Indians and the Pakistanis ran most of the businesses in the country and they worked in the civil service as well. And the wildlife suffered too during this period of chaos because everything began to fall apart. Abote attempted to come back from his hiding in Tanzania but that counter coup failed. <clears throat> in 1979, Tanzania finally invaded Uganda and overthrew Amin. In the next year, there were four governments before Oboti finally managed to wrangle his way into power again. He was overthrown by two of his generals, again, Okelos. The same year, Yoweri Museveni came in with his guerrillas and overthrew the Okelos. So as you can see, it was a chaotic period. We managed to keep going through this whole time, trying to keep a low profile, profile and, and just stay out of the way of the fighting, which we did. We really had, we had a few bad experiences, but no one was killed, no one was injured in the project. As I said, soon after Emin took over, well, we thought it didn't seem too bad. Oh, wait, no, I have to go on and tell you about this. These are the consequences of these evil regimes of Amin, Amin, Idi Amin and Milton Obote. Each of the two regimes are estimated to have killed at least 300,000 Ugandans. 
there was a shortage of all supplies, everything, everything that was manufactured. Fortunately, we lived in an area where they still produced a lot of fruits and vegetables. So we were okay in that regard. Insecurity was, was terrible. Breakdown of the civil service. No one was being paid, so corruption increased. Professional ethics were lost. The roads were in disrepair, disrepair. And we had all of these awful military roadblocks to deal with, often drunken soldiers, not, not much fun. Anyway, as I started to say, the first year of Amin, it didn't look like it was going to be too bad. So um, I was probably crazy, but I, I led a field course from, uh, for five students from the Rockefeller University. And there were some really brilliant people in this class. We all learned a lot. I learned a lot from them and I hope they learned something from me. One of the people on this course was a man named Peter Wasser. And those of you who know anything about the Mangabe literature, Peter did for his project on this course was a st short study on Mangabees. And he became so enthralled with that that he came back the following year to do his PhD thesis, one of the very best ever completed in Kibali. Not long after this, I was given an honorary appointment at Makere University in Kampala, which allowed me to take on graduate students from, from Uganda. And here are three of them. Uh, John Kasanini, who is a botanist and looked at the impact of logging on forest regeneration. Isabelle Basuta, who initially started off studying rodents and the impact of logging on rodent populations and how they interacted with forest regeneration. He then went on to do his PhD on chimpanzees the first really serious study of chimpanzees in Kibali. And then Jerry Luanga, who that man studied everything. Um, he was very interested in vegetation, rodents, dikers, uh, red colobus, red tailed blue monkeys and chimpanzees as well. He ended up being the best director we had uh, of the uh, research station. We, as I mentioned earlier, we tried to work with the school teachers and here's a, a large group who came, in, for, came out for the day. We gave them a tour through the forest and sat down and gave them a little lecture about the importance of conserving rainforest. And hopefully they took some of these lessons back to their students. It sort of called them the multiply, multiplier effect or a um, surge effect, you could call a ripple effect. So, you, you know, assuming each of these teachers had 60 students or so or 70 students now, um, hopefully those lessons were passed on. Snare poaching was uh, very prominent still in Kibali, which meant that some of these poor animals, it's a terrible way of hunting, but here's this poor diker with the, the broken leg and this poor chimp, uh, he lost both of his feet to snares. Apparently he's still alive. He crawls along the ground and he can climb trees quite well. So I started working with the game department. They gave me two game, uh, game guards who went out patrolling to collect snares. And when they encountered net hunters, which was the other major form of hunting, they would try to confiscate the nets. I provided logistic support to the game guards and a bonus system for all of the hunting materials that they collected. On this one day though, they asked me to give them transport out and to accompany them after some people they knew were deep in the forest net hunting. So we drove along an old logging road and um, many, many hours later, we encountered this group of, I don't know how many they were, 15 to 20 hunters. And fortunately they all fled. We commandeered the nets and the spears, which we destroyed. This poor female diker was killed with her fetus. But the, the, this was effective in a small way, but it did not deal with the elephant poaching. Was, these guys were working with AK-47s and this was something we couldn't manage with a simple 22 rifle. I'll not go into that. There's a big story there on that whole elephant poaching and how we tried to deal with that. Um, I'll just try to summarize a little bit about the Kibali project here. I mean, you know, after 18 years of research, it's kind of hard to summarize things quickly and simply, but um, we learned a lot about the primates, the behavioral ecology, the comparative uh, biology of these different species. And of course, a lot about how the rainforest ecosystem functioned. We learned a lot about the impacts of selective logging on wildlife and forest regeneration. I'd say probably one of the more important things is the establishment of a, a very, very active research station for research and education. It's now 52 years old. And I'm told that this summer, the place was jam packed with people despite COVID and everything. And we led, we created a successful campaign for establishment of Kibale National Park, probably the most important thing. 
I reckon that now Kibali is probably one of the best, if not the best, protected national parks in Africa. Maybe Mahali is right up there. After Kibali, I moved next door to Kenya, where I continued with a project on the Tana River that I initiated in 1972, working with the late Clive Marsh, who studied the endangered red colobus monkey there. <clears throat> 1998, I started working with Margaret Kennard, another student on the endangered and um, endemic mangabe monkey of the Tana River. And then other students came along as well. So that, that went along pretty well. <clears throat> in 1991, I moved over to Zanzibar to work on again, another endangered and endemic red colobus species. <clears throat> I then began collaborating with Kirsten Sykes who did both her master's and PhD research there in addition to learning every week, everything we could about the red colobus, we lobbied for national park status. There was another problem we had to try and deal with. And that was the sp getting speed, speed brakes put in. It was one road that ran through a major part of the uh, habitat of the red colobus. The monkeys would have to cross this road to move from one forest patch to another. And until the road had been improved, they were fairly successful at doing so. But once the road is paved, to accommodate tourists, we began to see an increasing rate of road kills. They were getting killed by vehicles. I have to say the Zanzibaris as a whole did not particularly care about red colobus monkeys and they, they never tried to slow down. So after many, many months of lobbying for speed brakes, uh, we got them in place and it reduced the mortality. Once it was clear that Kirsten was gonna carry on with the project, I moved to the Zunga mountains of South Central Tanzania it's a place I was familiar with from short visits long ago, but I worked there from 1997 to 2009. I started off with Carolyn Ehart and Tom Butinsky, and we were trying to understand more about the endemic red colobus and mangabe that lived there. We were soon joined by other students, Andy Marshall and Francesco Rovetto. A lot of research has been done in, in the Yudzungwas and the research on the primates as well. Francesco was played a really critical role. He could see the, the long-term future of research there. And so he went about establishing and now runs a field research station there. And it's very, very successful. This is all to his credit. He did the bulk of the work on getting this running. Before I move on to talk briefly about conservation, um, I wanna make a few broad suggestions um, and these, I elaborate more on these in that paper I mentioned to you that was published in Primates earlier this year. The main thing is, is to keep your eyes open and watch and describe what you see. Don't get tied down by predetermined categories. Many people ha have data sheets or data recorders of some sort in which they have all these predetermined categories and they go on entering data that way. Yeah, now a certain, to a certain degree, you have to have this kind of data, but keep your eyes open. And best of all, collect your own data so that you can better understand the context in which these events are happening. All too often, I'm seeing an unfortunate trend these days in which professors and students are getting other people to collect their data. You'll get someone who's had almost no education collecting your data for you. They, they don't necessarily have the same, not saying that they can't do this and have the capabilities, but um, they don't have that same rigid, rigorous training that you get as a student and as a full professor. And you do not understand the context in which the data were collected. In line with this, don't let hypotheses and predictions influence what you see. Keep your eyes open. There are other things happening around you. Be opportunistic. I'm reminded as an example, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, early on in my studies in, in Kibali, I was heading out to do a systematic study of a group of red, red tail monkeys. And I heard this strange loud call of a monkey. And I said, I sort of recognize that, but it's not quite right. And so I said, to heck with this systematic study I'm about to do, I'm going to see who's making that call. And that's when I discovered my first hybrid monkey in Kibali. And that led to all sorts of studies on hybrid monkeys in Kibali. Objectivity is the key. Keep that in mind. Have a naturalistic approach. Be aware of what's going on around your study subjects. Don't just focus on your study subjects. Observe the biotic and abiotic factors that are part of the milieu, part of the system. And I cannot overemphasize the importance of the comparative approach. 
Take every opportunity you can to study other species and other study sites. I'm gonna switch quickly to um, um, conservation issues. Uh, we're all aware of the immediate and proximate threats to primates, habitat degradation, fragmentation, loss and hunting. This is an interesting way of looking at things that's called landscape reduction, forest landscape reduction. This includes not only total forest clearance, but it's things like heavy logging, major logging or forest fragmentation. And as you can see in this 13 year period, a tremendous amount of land was lost in these few countries that I selected from the publication. And percentage doesn't tell you everything. So it's a low percentage in DRC, but 27,000 square kilometers was lost in a 13 year period. Serious problem. So what are the ultimate problems driving this over exploitation, oh, yeah, over consumption? Yes, anything that exceeds the carrying capacity. This is driven by at least two factors, unsustainable human population growth. This is typical of many tropical countries, but especially Africa and excessive consumption per capita. This is more typical of developed countries such as the US of A. And that in turn is driven by different economic paradigms. Give you an idea of the population problem. Um, here we look at the estimated populations from the United Nations estimated for 2022 and the total population density. These densities are, are really quite high for countries that are to a large extent dependent on subsistence agriculture. If you then convert these densities to that per arable land and land that can really be uh, cultivated, you see that the problem is even worse. This is totally unsustainable. So there are real problems here. And this exemplifies it, the population problem even further. Anytime you have annual increases in population of this magnitude, you're in trouble. Look at the doubling time. These populations are going to double in, in 20 to 27 years. Uganda already has 45 million people. What's it going to do with nearly 100 million people in 21 years? This is a tiny country. It's a real serious problem that needs to be addressed. But that isn't the only problem. So we've not only got a population increase, but then you have this, what they call demographic inertia. Here you can see in this age pyramid, age structure pyramid, that over half of Uganda's population is younger than the 15 years of age, younger than 15. So even if you could get each couple to have just two children, when half of your population starts reproducing, even with two children, the population will continue to increase. So it's a real serious problem. Africa is clearly not following the model of the demographic transition. In the demographic transition, before you have um, really effective medicines, you have high birth rates and high death rates. Then you introduce really effective medicine, so-called Western medicine. The death rate goes down. The population starts to increase as a consequence. There's a lag time in the birth rates. Hey, we don't need to have 10 kids after all to have five survive. And that starts to go down. And eventually they will get both get down here, death birth rate and death rate are low. The population not only reaches an asymptote, but it begins to decline as well. But Africa just keeps right on just chugging along at roughly 3% a year, certainly more than. So it's a serious problem. Uh, economic paradigms, capitalism versus ecological economics, big difference. In neoclassical economics or capitalism, it depends on an ever expanding economy. That means ever expanding consumption of natural resources, whether it's due to population growth or just increased consumption per capita. Now this ignores and defies, or tries to defy the first two laws of thermodynamics. Go to your physics textbooks and read up on it. It's unsuitable, it just can't work. <clears throat> Ecological economics really puts ecology at the forefront. This is the essence of everything. This is a, an old textbook, but I, I really like their definition here. <clears throat> and there's a lot more stuff that's come out since then, the journals and more books on ecological economics. I suggest you look into that. So um, in contrast to ecological economics, neoclassical economics advocates that the economic system is the whole and that it's not a subsystem of our global system. Just, sorry, that it's just a, a subsystem. Um, economic growth in ecological economics is impossible in a closed system. And that's what we are. We are in a closed system. 
And such, this whole paradigm threatens our natural resources upon which we all depend. What ecological economics advocates is a steady state economy, basically just chugging along at a standard level, not no increase or decrease. It's a union of economics and ecology. Basically the policies and practices of ecological economics should be that ecology has uh, the primary concern. You don't do anything if it's gonna be destructive to our planet earth, which um, is a hard thing to imagine. So try to bring a few summer points here. Um, the approximate factors affecting the loss of primates in their forests, agriculture, logging, hunting, ultimate factors, overconsumption, population growth, increased consumption per capita. The trick is how do we change attitudes and behavior? That's the real challenge. The conservation, some of the conservation lesson, lessons I've learned, a law enforcement is imperative. Large parks are best. You need science to convince politicians, sometimes it works, not always, but having political support, support is imperative. Winning public support of the general population is also very, very challenging. But if you can win their support, then your conservation efforts are going to be a lot easier. You wanna avoid just trying to pay them off though, because humans are humans. They never seem to have enough. <clears throat> From a long-term approach, education and family planning are the way to go, but this can take generations. I would suggest if you're trying to conserve a particular area, involve as many individuals and organizations as you can to make it uh, last a lot longer, but avoid competition. We know people are people and they do get competitive at times. Keep your mind open to alternative strategies. There's always some new ideas coming along. Finally, at least but not least, perseverance is critical. You have to persevere no matter how, um, how oh, sad things may look. Thank you for your attention, and I'd be glad to try and deal with any of your questions or comments.